Our next talk is by Robert Leach and it's called Redefining Borders. Robert is a human nurse who transitioned into the veterinary field six years ago where he began working at a veterinary specialist centre and locum nursing at a small animal clinic. He has completed a Master of Veterinary Studies from the University of Sydney with a dissertation in Advanced Reproductive Technologies, exploring potential avenues of eradicating African swine fever through genetic editing. For the past two years, Robert has been working at a wildlife rescue and conservation NGO in Southern Africa, and he returned home during the peak of the bush bushfires to coordinate the Vets Beyond Borders Australian Veterinary, Emer Veterinary Emergency Response Team. Robert completed further studies in animal welfare, is now in the full-time role of Programs Manager with Vets Beyond Borders. Robert is an Associate Member of the ABA. Go for it, Robert. I want to delve into some really complex barriers that we might face as members of the veterinary profession and how we might be able to work with these challenging situations through what I call redefining borders. And I just want to include that I have nothing to disclose. I'm going to be drawing upon some of my own experiences from my time working overseas. And I'm hoping that by the end of this, I might have redefined any of your borders into new opportunities. I'm going to be touching on some culturally sensitive topics of animal welfare that we, we just don't see in the Western veterinary world. My first experience of it was witnessing puppies, kittens, and monkeys like this one alive and being held in the air at busy intersections frequented by tourists. And of course, many would buy them to try to save them. These animals would be crying for their mothers or milk, or sometimes not even at all after exhaustion from the blistering sun. They would be fed because they're far more valuable alive. And I think I can confidently say that many of us seeing this would be quite concerned. But, and this is sort of a, a prefacing point that I need to emphasize, we need to consider the bigger picture here. We can't charge in and expect change. That's entirely insensitive to just assume that our way is the right way. We can't crush these borders. They'll just come back as soon as we leave. That's why we need to redefine them, reshape them. And that's really the underlying message I wanna drive home here. So let's begin. How do you argue the life of an animal when someone relies on its death to feed their family today, feed them tomorrow, or in the case of the pangolin, probably a lifetime? These animals are estimated to sell at 700 US dollars per kilogram. This one I helped rehabilitate was about 11 kilograms, so 7,700 US dollars. <laughs> this walking pine cone that's cooked as a delicacy or its scales used in traditional Chinese medicines. Now, this species is the most trafficked animal in the world, so it has a lot of international groups fighting to protect it from extinction. But let's bring this back home to be a bit more relatable to us. To be a successful practicing veterinary professional, you have to have pretty decent communication to deal with clients, owners, stakeholders, whoever. And we can use that ability to communicate, to educate. Now you can't just tell someone not to eat if they had the chance, that's unrealistic. That's why educating the upcoming generation is so vital. Vital to understanding the importance of a species and what it means for a species to be nearing extinction. And it's not just new generations over in those countries. Sure, you may join us on one of our Vets Beyond Borders community awareness programs. But I also want you to think about back home. We need to educate those close to us. We can't win the fight against illegal wildlife trading while we're still fighting ignorance in our own countries. Spread awareness and education and reshape those borders to understand that a small use of your not so obvious veterinary skills can make a difference to species survival. Now, what about when someone instinctively thinks to kill an animal for a fear of their safety? Snakes are a prime example of a border between survival instincts and a lack of knowledge. From my experience working in Malawi, for a lot of the general public, 
a snake is a snake, whether it's our resident three meter rock python, Henry, in these photos, or the local Mozambique spitting cobra that would visit us every few weeks. A snake is a snake and you should club it to death before it strikes. And people were scared for good reason. One of my close friends was bitten by a highly venomous green mamba. She was rushed to the local hospital only to find that they didn't stock the anti-venom and she sadly died and she was only 24. And now many of her family and friends think that all snakes will do this. But as a veterinary professional, how do we break down that barrier of instinctive fear? Well, you don't break, you redefine. Similar to the pangolin, you use your communication skills to educate. You won't have it. And by education, I don't mean putting a snake around your neck. I'm talking about educating about snake's body signals, maybe when it's safe to back away, or in some cases where it's safe to just remain still. We cannot change that the opinion that snakes are harmful, and we shouldn't. We can only work with communities to educate how to respond and adapt to a known problem, redefine that border. Yeah, the next one is superstition. Owls mean so many different things to different cultures. In Greenland, the Inuit see owls as a source of guidance. Across India, there's various different beliefs, one being that the barn owl, as four on the left, are seen as a symbol of wisdom. And here in Australia, the indigenous community believe owls represent the souls of women and are sacred. But not all cultures view owls in this generally positive light. In many cultures of the world, owls, like this fluff ball on the right, is seen as an omen of death. In the countries I worked in, it was well understood that it's best to just stone an owl to death as soon as you come across one before something bad happens to you. Considering this barrier spans across generations, there's certainly no silver bullet for this. So of course, education, again, it's key to redefining this border and teaching communities that owls are just ordinary, beautiful animals too. And when I'm educating, I use me as an example. I say, I've worked with this species for a long time and I'm still alive. I haven't been struck by lightning or possessed by witchcraft. And I also refer to my coworkers who are Malawian. I say, same goes for them. It's so simple. It's just using that communication and understanding of where someone's coming from and working with their existing ideas to reshape it. I also want to bring up quite a sensitive topic, euthanasia. From what most of us subscribe to is that the decision lies in the hands of qualified vets. End of story. But you'll find that in some countries, the decision of euthanasia involves not only the vet, but sometimes also those with religious authority. Now, this is a really sensitive border because you may come across a situation where euthanasia might be the most appropriate course of action for welfare reasons. But there's a bit of a riff in the decision-making process that's either out of your hands or deemed as culturally insensitive if you proceed. Working in different parts of the world, it's vital to be able to communicate rationally, but in a sensitive manner. It's harnessing those communication skills to try to redefine that the thought that euthanasia equals death, period. It's instead taking more of an angle that, okay, death is inevitable, but suffering doesn't have to be. And you've been gifted this privilege to be able to help with that. I also want to tell you a story of my friend Johnson in Tanzania. Apart from traveling between villages doing mobile desexing clinics, Johnson has a lot of donkey welfare education. He told me that unlike the cows being able to graze at their pleasure, the donkeys were walking sometimes tens of kilometers to the marketplace in the mornings, tied up and then needing to travel back home late in the afternoon. And the only time they have for eating is overnight. Now, we can't go in to say, oh, you're doing this wrong, because at the end of the day, many are thinking about feeding themselves and their families. So Johnson goes into these villages and educates people that 
if you want to keep coming back to the market with a living donkey, you need to feed it and give it water. He's now taught locals to carry some hay with them so the donkeys can eat while tied up. Johnson's already redefined this border for us. He's reshaped the understanding that good animal welfare benefits the people too. So it's a win-win. In closing, I want to remind you of one last border, rabies. It's the disease that's entirely preventable and the barrier to global eradication is access to resources. And it's not even access to the vaccines. It's the vets to administer it on a large scale. In 2017, it was estimated that over 59,000 people die annually from rabies. That number could be zero. And it's just one of our missions at Vets Beyond Borders. So come help us. Come help Johnson and his donkeys. Come spread education to benefit animals across the world. And while you're at it, why not redefine yourself? Redefine your own borders as a vet and the global borders that stand in the way of a world of better health for animals and people. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Well, that's our final Vet Ed talk for this year. And I'd like to thank all our wonderful and courageous speakers. The results of the judging will be announced next week. If anyone feels they'd like to deliver a Vet Ed talk on their passion next year, please get in touch with us. We're always on the lookout for interesting and inspiring stories and speakers. Thank you very much. Vet Plus is a unique business support program created to empower veterinary business with marketing support and digital solutions like the new range of mobile-friendly templates that let you build and manage your website entirely yourself. The simple editing tools make it easy for everyone. Vet Plus also helps your practice connect more with clients. The handy First Aid for Pets mobile app is a great example. It's packed full of helpful articles, and best of all, it's designed to promote your practice and your brand. Take advantage of the pre-made marketing and social media campaigns that are supported with automated planning and reminder tools. Feel free to browse the online library and place your order anytime, day or night. Vet Plus members also benefit from exclusive offers, like the medical grade vaccine fridge, as well as discounted access to hand-picked digital service providers. Vet Plus is also equipped with practical business tools, including an interactive profitability calculator, a 3D joint simulation app, and a unique 12-step digital transformation program. You'll discover new learning opportunities with Vet Plus, including interactive business skills modules, a library of technical resources, and client awareness tools. And we're here to help. Vet Plus members are fully supported by a local Vet Plus support team and 24-7 veterinary technical support. You'll also have access to premium vaccine support offers and an online knowledge base for instant answers to the most common questions. To find out more about how Vet Plus can benefit your business, contact your Bow Ringer Ingelheim Territory Manager today.